Forbes Books presents Sustainable Leadership and Disruptive Growth with David Radlow. Transformation for a new and better world. Here's David. My guest this week is Steve Killalay. Steve is a global philanthropist focused on peace and sustainable development. Over the last two decades, Steve has applied his business skills to his many philanthropic activities, including an internationally renowned global think tank and a private family charity. He's also the author of Peace in the Age of Chaos, The Best Solution for a Sustainable Future. Steve, welcome to the podcast. Well, Dave, it's my pleasure to be here. Steve, before we get started, can you tell us how did an Australian IT entrepreneur become a global philanthropist? Well, it's a fairly long story, really, but I'll try and give you a very abridged version, Dave. So, started off, and actually, I started off as a quite a shy, retiring uh, computer programmer, like nothing better than to sit down and write programs and not really talk to people, would you believe? Different than what I am today. So, I developed uh, two computer programs, and off the back of them, uh, we launched the uh, two companies. The first one ended up publicly listed on NASDAQ, second on the Australian Stock Exchange. And sort of obviously through that period, I moved from sort of being a programmer to eventually end, ending up CEO of the companies I founded. So along the way, I've accumulated quite a decent amount of money. And I guess I spent a lot of my early days in my life surfing. And I looked in those days, I spent a lot of time living in a, you know, very remote places and with, in very, with very, very poor people. And I had a real understanding of uh, poverty, so I decided to set up a family foundation to work with the poorest of the poor. But what I didn't realise at that stage, working with the poorest of the poor, it took me to a, a lot of war zones, near post war zones, because in fact, that's where the poorest people in the world quite often reside. And it would have been maybe 18 years ago now, I was in northeast Kivu in the Congo, which is one of the more violent places in the world. I was walking through there and I started to think, well, what are the most peaceful nations in the world? Well, I guess a fantasy question, Dave. And so I searched the internet to see if I could find a ranking of the uh, countries of the world by the peacefulness, and I couldn't find anything. I thought, wow, that's a, 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 a really important thing to understand. So I then went around and went to a number of different uh, think tanks around the world, a number of different uh, your peace research organisations, and they all thought it was a good idea. None of them were thinking of doing anything like it. So that's how the Global Peace Index was born. But that poses a really profound question. This is a simple businessman like myself can be walking through Africa and wonder what are the most peaceful nations in the world and it hasn't been done, then how much do we know about peace? And I guess as a business guy, if you can't measure something, can you truly understand it? And if you can't measure it, how do you even know whether your actions are helping you or hindering you in achieving your goals? You simply do not. More than 20 years ago, you established the Charitable Foundation, now one of the largest private overseas aid organizations based in Australia. Can you tell us why you founded it and what kind of impact it has today? Well, I think it's been one of the better things that I've done in my life, actually. So it's, as you quite correctly point out, it's over 20 years ago now. And so I guess once I made a whole lot of money, I had more money than what, it was, what I could really productively spend in my life. So I started to think, what should I do with it? And I, just, and I guess I've always had sort of, I guess, a compassionate side to my character. So I decided to look, I wanted to really work with the, uh, the, uh, the poorest of the poor because I figured they were the ones with the most suffering. And so that's how it came about. Now, since then, uh, the organisation's done about 220 projects globally. Direct beneficiaries now, we count about 3.6 million people. So that's quite substantial. Nothing like a Bill Gates, but still, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite substantial numbers. And so my first project I ever did blew me away. I had a friend at the time, and he was treasurer of World Vision. So he took me up to Laos, and at that stage Laos was a closed country, and it was like going back a thousand years in time. In fact, you could go from the capital, the Entan, and drive down to Savannakit, which is the southern province. And as you drove along the road, and it's an eight-hour journey, you would not see one house, 
with a, a glass window in it. That's how far back it was in time. And so we did some water projects there. And like this was putting just simply putting wells in. And there were no wells within any of the villages. It was, it was quite remarkable. And so we provided, I think it was clean water for about 12,000 people. And what happened was that it reduced the death rate uh, for children under five from 18% to 12%. At that stage, that was some of the highest death rates in the world. You don't find anything like that anymore. anymore. And knocked out about one third of all waterborne disease. And I was hooked. And it cost less than $20 a head to do. I came back to that same area two years later and I was met with a lot of the uh, uh, government officials in the area, district government officials, and they put on a lunch for me and they said, you know, the area where you put the water in, we didn't have a cholera outbreak, but in the two surrounding districts for the last two years, we've had cholera. And again, it just drove home for small amounts of money, you can actually uh, uh, turn people's lives around. So we've done a whole range of different projects now. Uh, cataracts, we've done a lot of them. That's one I love. So if you go to Africa, you've got a large proportion of the population who are blind simply because of cataracts. So we've done, let's say, Rwanda at one stage there. We picked one third of Rwanda with the aim of removing a, 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 all cataracts, or all, all, all blindness caused by cataracts. And I can remember once... Uh, being at one of the places where we were doing it and there was this woman there and they wrapped the bandages off from around her eyes and she was about two weeks early she'd had the operation and it was the first time she'd been able to see in 20 years and it's just amazing when you look into people's places like that so we also do a lot of work around the uh, different forms of development so we do a lot of health care, uh, maternal and uh, child health care, done a lot of them, done a lot of famine relief. In fact, we're feeding 20,000 people in Zimbabwe at the moment. So famine relief, uh, they're strong on them. We've done uh, microeconomic development projects in many different parts, a lot of them water-based, and then the produce which you produce out of the water, from the, uh, the uh, produce which you produce from the food which you get from the water, and then sort of creating small canning factories and stuff around them. There'd be some other examples of uh, projects we've done. Funded schools in the uh, Myanmar, some great schools are funded there. One particularly run by a, uh, by a monk, which provides free education for 10,000 kids in Mandalay. Turned up there one time, and, and there's these uh, uh, 400 uh, uh, kids in the school, all in, all in monk's robes. And I said, gee, where did they come from? He says, well, I've been, one of my friends asked me if I could look after uh, 400 kids from Corinne State. He says, because there's a civil war going on up there. And he says, the kids either get pressed into the civil militias, fighting the Myanmar government, or they get pressed into the government forces. He says, but they never get any education. So, the, I said, yes, I can take the kids, and I had the obviously education. I had some basic rooms I could put them in, but I had no money to feed them. So what I did is I took them in as novice monks. That way they could walk around with their begging bowls in the morning to collect food, which is the custom within the uh, Myanmar. So they're just a couple of the different things we've done over the years. Well, that's a tremendous impact. Many people have hopes for world peace, and you were the creator of the Global Peace Index. It's a quantitative measurement of global peacefulness. How is it measured, and how does the conflict in Ukraine affect the GPI regionally and internationally? Please go ahead and kindly reflect as well on secondary factors, such as the rise of the cost of fuel, foodstuffs, and shortages in the worldwide as a whole. So the Global Peace Index consists of three different domains, and those domains are ongoing conflict, militarisation, and internal safety and security. So the first two domains are fairly self-evident, but the internal safety and security covers things like the levels of homicide, violent crime, number of police, number of people incarcerated, access to small weapons, a political terror scale, that's the government's... A, a, terror on its citizens, if you like, and a range of other measures as well. And so we've got 23 indicators all together, and the three domains you can measure separately, or you bring together to create the index. So the composite index 
is the Global Peace Index. And so there's different weighings for each of the different indicators. Each of those indicators, the weighings are really determined by the impacts. Anything which causes a death has the highest, uh, highest measure and probably the lowest measure would be the perceptions of criminality within a society, which we get from one of the Gallup surveys, which they do worldwide. And so that's the construction and what brings the uh, uh, index together. And as you start to look at the results, it gets quite fascinating in uh, many, many different ways. So, for example, if we go back over, let's say, the last, uh, year, since 2008 and the founding of the Global Peace Index, global peacefulness has deteriorated by 3%. In fact, of the 14 years, it's deteriorated 11 of those years, just to give it in perspective. But the deteriorations in most years are very, very small. But even with global peace having deteriorated by 3%, if we look at the number of countries which improved, they're more than the number of countries which deteriorated. And what we can see from that is it's much easier to fall in peace than it is to improve peace. So peace improves gradually over time. Now, as we're sitting here today, we've just completed uh, this year's global uh, uh, peace index and it's still to be released, but so I won't go into the full details of the findings, but we find things such as the political terror scale, uh, political instability, and a couple of, and one or two other indicators as well, and now at the worst levels since 2008. And that's, that's of concern, particularly when we start to look at the global situation today. So we've got rising inflation, uh, GDP for the next couple of years is going to be, de going to be depressed, if not negative for many countries. Servicing of debt is getting a uh, getting harder. And we've got the knock-on effects from lockdowns in China with their COVID lockdowns, which is depressing their economy and causing all sorts of issues with supply chains. So we'd expect these indicators to become worse over the next two, next couple of years. And so on top of that, now you've also got the Ukraine conflict going on as well. And so if we look at the Ukraine conflict, it's obviously, uh, when we look at it sort of for this year, uh, the Ukraine's going to have the largest drop of any country in the world. The Russia and Eurasia region will have the biggest drop, and Russia's right down at the very, very bottom of the global peace index now. Maybe not quite as bad as countries like Afghanistan or Syria, but very, very close to it. So now let's have a look at what effect the Ukraine's war is likely to have on a whole range of things going forward. So obviously we've got the Global Peace Index. So you're going to see the relations with neighbouring states fall off for a whole range of European countries. A lot of those countries now are going to increase their uh, military expenditure as a percentage of GDP or just increase their military expenditure flat. Uh, that, if we look at it and they, they you know, the members of NATO uh, decide to reach the commitment, reach the 2% target, which NATO recommends, that increased spending with NATO uh, members by 7% on their military over the next couple of years. That's quite, that's quite substantial. That'll come around and have an impact on the Global Peace Index as well. We can also see that uh, fuel prices are increasing. We can see that in relationship, let's say, with gas and with oil, uh, because Russia's been a big exporter of them. The sanctions on them are impacting there. We can also see it with food prices. And there's knock-on effects from all this as well. So I've just noticed over, overnight, India's now a, a stopped exporting sugar. They've recently stopped exporting wheat because they want to keep it for their own internal supplies. Brazil's also stopped exporting sugar. So we're now starting to see protectionism rise in a number of different countries around food supplies. Now, if we went to Africa, for example, and uh, this was before any of these increases, uh, what we found was that two out of every three people in Africa are food insecure. And that means that at some point in the last six months, they weren't able to get adequate food. And so that number is only going to increase because in many of these countries, people live uh, hand to mouth. So really the money they earn that day is what puts the food on the table that evening. So small increases in food prices have 
radical effects, and this will come round in, in many ways, so I imagine it will affect political instability, violent demonstrations, and, and, and a range of other indicators probably related to conflict. So you've got the rising prices there as well. Now, there are a whole range of other things which we can see knock-on effects from this as well. We can see Russia and China initially become closer, although China's now, so they can see uh, the uh, situation in the Ukraine and the difficulty Russia's having on actually winning and the international reactions are pulling back. But this is a breaking of the uh, international system which we've had in place for a uh, uh, many, many years. So you're starting to see this bipolar uh, stretching. We can see that uh, many uh, countries now, like in this, particularly in the US, are looking at onboarding. They're worried about the dependence, so let's say, on China for supply chains. So what we found is that global GDP, uh, so trade as a percentage of global GDP, actually peaked in 2008. It's been slightly falling away since. And I think what we're seeing now is a further fractioning of it. In fact, if we look at Davos over the last uh, week or so, what we'll find is a lot of the champions of globalisation are now struggling for new ways of defining globalisation as it starts to fragment. So there's another offshoot from it. On the war front, there's been a number of different innovations which haven't been seen before. Certainly, the use of drones in war uh, is uh, coming more and more effective, and it's uh, quite effective against heavy artillery. Uh, and, uh, this is, and this has been an ongoing trend for some years. But the one which really I think is most fascinating is the gathering of intelligence. So the gathering intelligence in the past was done by uh, military organisations, intelligence organisation. It was then vetted, curated, and then distributed. So it's actually after the fact. So what we can see in the Euro Ukraine war, intelligence is getting gathered by people on the ground, getting posted through social media. That could be a Facebook page. It could be through Twitter and then share it uh, uh, raw and uncensored uh, uh, across vast numbers of people. So what you're seeing intelligence these days, it's uh, instantaneous, it's shared in real time and shared on uh, in, and open to a massive number of people. And that really is quite a big change from, let's say, uh, war even a decade ago. Thanks for that, Steve. It's a practical guide to assist in businesses, organizations, and travelers, people around the globe. Your resources on Global Terrorism Index on crime and terrorism has been quite helpful in identifying where to do business, where not to do business, travel, provide safe relief efforts for the poor and disadvantaged, and certain areas how to avoid based on your personal risk tolerance. Can you kindly take us through how you identify the data points to make it into your report? Yeah, so what we do is we look at the terrorist incidences, and so we look at one as the number of incidences, the number of deaths caused by those incidences. We also look at the, the number of injuries, and we also, also track kidnappings as well. Uh, and put them into the uh, terrorism index. Now, we only do non-state actors, so we don't actually look at state actors in terms of terrorism. So there's another measure which we use in other reports called, called uh, a political terror scale. So that'll be covered by that. So what, we, what we're really focusing on is the non-state actors. And so as we're looking at that today, uh, the hot spot of the world is really the Sahel. But in many ways, terrorism has improved uh, 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 dramatically over time. And in fact, this year, we're, what we've noticed is that the number of terrorist deaths uh, have been the uh, number of terrorist deaths are down, but the total impact of terrorism is the best it's been since 2008. And what and that's a lot of that's on the back of the less terrorism attacks in uh, yeah, Syria, Iraq, the winding down of those wars, the Islamic State, and the loss of its territory. But so it's lost territory, and uh, is, well has not got territory in places like Syria and Iraq anymore. There's been a, a swing over to the Sahel, so we can see a number of terrorist organisations emerging in the Sahel. So if we look at, we had the fastest growing terrorist group in the world, 
in the Sahel, uh, uh, JNIM, and also the uh, most lethal terrorist group in the world was also in the Sahel in Niger, and that was Islamic State of West Africa, so where on average each attack killed 14 people. So you've got these changing dynamics uh, yeah, yeah, at the moment going on with terrorism. If we could be kind enough to drill down into a practical example of where certain areas of a country are moderately safe and certain areas are exceedingly dangerous for crime, opportunistic kidnapping and terrorism. For example, let's examine your review of the Philippines backed by your report in British and U.S. State Department advisories where certain regions have moderate and extreme threats. Is it common or not common in these instances to have kidnapping in, quote, safe areas and be taken to other areas? What's your assessment? Yeah, well, I think all this gets, Dave, gets very, very complicated. Obviously, the Philippines, if you went down to a, uh, Mindanao in the south or you went up north, you've got a number of groups up there which are uh, uh, aimed at sort of uh, trying to succeed, secede from the, the Philippines. So some of these areas are very, very dangerous and you would not want to be going there unless you were sort of uh, accompanied by uh, 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 people who really knew what they were doing. Now, if you went to the capital uh, of, uh, let's say, Manila, for example, you're, uh, you're not going to face uh, uh, Islamic threats or anything like that, but there's high levels of violent crime, so you'd have to be really worried about violent crime. And so your chances of being kidnapped there are probably not as high, but you're highly likely, if you weren't careful, suffer from violent crime. So I think you've really got to be look at each of the individual situations and where you're going. Whereas if you went into other parts of rural Philippines, you're probably pretty safe if you're in a small village there, particularly if you if you know the locals. So one of the things I always do, I always check uh, fairly carefully the local conditions. I also do that by talking to locals, and when I'm going somewhere, I'm always accompanied by locals as, as well, and then I try and get the right level of protection. So, for example, like I was up in uh, uh, Garissa in uh, 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 northern Kenya some years back, and we were heading up to the Somali border to look at a project we're doing up there, and that was, we are right up on the Somali border. And so in that, in that instance, there were two cars, and we had four uh, 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 armed guards two in each car which were accompanying us in case we ran into the wrong people. And so that's a high level of protection. Now in other situations, uh, if I'm going to go out, let's say go out to a restaurant, or go out and maybe have a drink in a bar, I wouldn't do it unless I go with the locals I'm working with because they'll know where it's safe and where it's not safe. And so generally it comes back, you've really got to be just really just, it comes back to just being sensible in these places. Now, one of the things you can do, let's say, from the Global Terrorism Index thing, we're talking about that. So all the terrorist attacks, a, a, a record which we use, are geocoded. So that means we know exactly the point where the terrorist attacks happen. So from that, let's say, if you're looking up in the Sahel, you can see that the areas where you're getting the most terrorist attacks is along the borders of countries, let's say, between Niger and Mali, for example. And what that highlights then is, well, if you're going up there, it's a, from, from perspective of terrorism or kidnapping, it, it's really dangerous. But if you're sticking in the capital, where there's a lot of troops and a high security presence, then it's probably not so dangerous. But again, there will be violent crime. What's the best way to travel to these areas if you're maybe a prime target? Be vigilant, hire former special forces for security, have locals around you, or all of the above? Yes, I think, look, it it's really situational dependent. If you're going somewhere, you, you, want to, you want to go. I was playing golf with someone recently, and they're saying, oh, yeah, yeah, look, one of our friends is heading off overseas. They're going to a, uh, Cancun for a holiday because they saw something on television. They watched a television show which made it look, or television series, which made it look really good. And I turned around and said, well, do you realise six of the ten cities in the world with the highest homicide rate are in Mexico. 
And I think Cancun's one of them. And so that's fine if the people stay inside a nice resort there, which they saw on this television show. But if they start wandering out, going to bars and try and have a bit of fun and mix with the locals, then that could get highly, highly dangerous. So again, it comes back, I think, a lot of it to common sense. I think there's their common sense. You can, a lot of people travel in really quite a, a unsafe places and are safe. And that comes back again to how you do it and the level of protection. And I think the example of the one up Garissa is one example. We worked in northern Uganda at one stage on a, a project on the rehabilitation of child soldiers. And so that was the, uh, and so the uh, your Lord's Resistance Army, which really is the worse than Islamic State, worst group I've ever come across. So working up there, and so when we're flying in there, you'd be in light planes. And so normally, you know, a light plane comes in and it comes down, it comes in at an even angle and lands. So we'd be, we'd started about uh, your, your 10,000 feet and then just do really tight circles till we landed. And the reason for that is, so there are any LRA uh, militias out there that they couldn't take the plane out with a rocket. So there are other examples of just things you have to do to stay safe. But if we thought there was a high chance or even, even a reasonably low chance of getting taken out with a rocket doing that kind of manoeuvre, we wouldn't do it. So again, sort of the, 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 this I'm using that as an example because that's a, 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 a high. A, a, yeah, I mean, want to use the word high risk, but it's not quite right. It's sort of it, it's a high alert situation. Uh, so I think really, it's it, yeah, people have just really got to be sensible where, wherever they go. And I think for the average person, if they're going going somewhere, look up your, uh, the advice which is given by uh, your various uh, governments, foreign foreign policy departments, uh, and sort of like the, uh, there'd be US State Department in the US, for example. Check that out. Uh, and then really, if you're going to make sure the accommodation you're staying in is sensible, and then just be careful with what you do. Thanks for sharing that. Well, hang on, Steve. We have to take a break. But coming up in the second part of my conversation with global philanthropist Steve Killalay, the author of Peace in the Age of Chaos, Steve talks about his own legacy. Well, I guess I don't really think too much about my personal legacy uh, because, like, let's face it, when you're dead, you're dead. What I do want is I hope that the output of the activities of my life have some positive impact on life. To connect with David, go to davidradlow.com. David's book set, The Principles of Cartel Disruption and Secret Stories of Leadership, Growth and Innovation are available wherever books are sold. This has been Sustainable Leadership and Disruptive Growth with David Radlow, a presentation of Forbes Books.